Okay. Um, morning all. We seem to have sort of steadied in the low hundreds of attendees. So I think any late stragglers are now going to be significant outliers and are just going to have to miss the first couple of minutes. Um, for those of you who haven't met me before, I'm Philip Hughes. I'm one of the barristers at Guildhall Chambers. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen Sophie communicating with you thus far about slightly delaying start times for those of us who are a little more tardy, perhaps. Um, the topic today is, is pretty obvious and pretty straightforward. I'm not going to repeat it to you. You all have known what it is, and that's why you chose to sign up and attend. Um, what I would say is the bad news is today's talk is unfortunately no substitute for going and having a look at the reforms and reading through them for yourself. Uh, having done that with Sophie uh, a number of times recently, the other bad news is they're not much fun to read through. They are quite dry. Um, the good news is that they bear more than a passing resemblance to the stage one, two and three RTA protocol that you are undoubtedly familiar with. Um, but I put that in at the start. I'm afraid there's no substitute for going and reading them. It's something you are going to have to suffer. Um, with that out of the way, perhaps we should crack on in earnest. Um, so this is just a slide setting out broadly how we're going to plot our way through today. Um, nothing particularly exciting on there. Um, we'll have a brief discussion of the new framework, how it pans out and how it works, walking you through issues of liability and then the whiplash injuries and tariffs themselves. Um, little more to say on that. Um, so perhaps if we get started with looking at the new framework itself, um, much was made about these proposals for quite a few years before they ultimately materialised. But the premise behind it was that it was intended to essentially deter fraudsters from bringing claims and sought to reduce insurance premiums as a result. Um, you'll note that they come into force with effect from the 31st of May. They have been long awaited and the government has now published the pre-action protocol the practice direction, along with changes to existing protocols as well. The most notable difference that, um, that has been brought in by these reforms is the increase to the small claims limit for personal injury of up to £5,000 and a £10,000 total value. Uh, and you'll have noticed as well that they've created essentially a portal similar to that that's been used in the stage one, two and three of the um, normal MOJ portal. Um, the issues here, of course, and it's absolutely trite to say that now majority of these small claims will be cost bearing. Um, given that the cost recovery on the small claims track is a lot more restrictive. Um, moving forward then. Uh, as another brief overview, there have been a number of sort of small changes in this protocol, protocol compared to the others. Uh, Phil can take you through those. Um, just perhaps one more thing to add on the change in, um, in value of small claims is obviously hitherto it's been very difficult to recover your costs if you are a defendant in the small claims track. Um, needing to show unreasonable conduct and courts have generally not been willing to accept uh, offers which haven't been accepted as sufficient to constitute unreasonable conduct. It is possible I think going forward that courts may change their view on that ever so slightly if a particularly competitive colder bank offer is made simply because the value of small claims and personal injury small claims is presumably going to be significantly more than it was previously would seemingly make little sense at least to me if a matter which historically would have been in the fast track where one could make an entirely valid part 36 offer now fell within the small claims track and defendants were were uh, sort of deprived, I suppose, of their most powerful weapon in, in getting their costs back. 
Um, but it may be that that is rather offset by the fact they pay less claimant costs anyway. But that, that is something to look out for, is how judges and courts going forwards treat offers made in personal injury matters, which now would fall into the small claims track, which wouldn't previously. Um, this slide, I suppose, it is it's telling that we're identifying the changes, um, because as we've already said, twice now, there's more than a passing resemblance to what we all know and don't really love. Um, and there are changes from that, um, which are not, not wholesale, but certainly substantial in a number of areas. Um, so one of the major differences on, on sort of liability now, I suppose, is that contributory negligence now an allegation of contributory negligence for something other than a seatbelt um, can remain within the portal. Uh, this would be a situation where a defendant accepts liability in part and then effectively the, the two parties have a barter about where they think contributory negligence should fall. Um, if agreement is reached between the two parties, then the matter remains in the portal to sort out quantum. Uh, if it's not agreed between the parties, then that presumably would be grounds for, for going out and, and getting to a determination on liability. We'll come back to that a bit more um, going forwards. Uh, the second point um, is, I suppose, broadly similar to how everyone understood the portal as it was already, and that the claimant has to obtain a report from usually a GP first up. Now, the difference is that Medco reports are built into the portal as opposed to being sorted out separately um, with the rider that there's going to be no pre-med offers on whiplash injuries, but that is confined to whiplash injuries. So you could conceivably have someone who has a whiplash injury and has injured, for example, their foot, um, just to pick an arbitrary body part in the same accident. You'd be perfectly entitled to make a pre-med offer on the foot but you would have to wait for a medical report until such time as you could make any offer on the whiplash element. Um, it doesn't quite make sense to me, but that is the way it is. And there seems to be no obvious reason why you would preclude offers on a single part of the body, um, but allow pre-med offers on other parts of the body. Um, similarly, I, I find it difficult to see how this could be properly policed if someone just made a global offer outside of the portal system and on the basis that if accepted, you just discontinue your portal claim. I, I struggle to see how that could be effectively policed, but perhaps we'll find out more about that going forwards. Um, the next bullet point we get to the sort of fourth one down about non-protocol vehicle losses is quite difficult to explain in isolation, um, but in effect, when you're deciding if something is of the values to go into the portal, you disregard in broad terms those vehicle costs which be, would be paid by an insurer or wouldn't have been paid by the claimant personally. So credit hire would be a non-protocol vehicle loss. So you couldn't drive something out of the portal by having a, a stonking great credit hire claim or having crashed a rather expensive vehicle. Um, we'll cover that in, in a bit more depth in a minute. Uh, the new definition for whiplash injury, of course, if you're going to put tariffs for something that you call a whiplash injury, you need to be fairly definite about what a whiplash injury is. We'll come to that. And also the possibility of uplift on injuries in exceptional circumstances, uh, a slightly vague term, which is no doubt going to become a term of art in, in due course. Uh, and we will come back to that and our interpretation of that. Um, going forwards, but that's sort of a broad overview of, of the changes we have. The first question that is obviously going to need to be asked is whether the claim is one that would fall within the protocol and the new portal. And the rules are quite clear about the types of cases that are and aren't suitable for this um, for this protocol. So um, not if it's a vulnerable road user um, and the examples are listed in the protocol themselves and include a motorcyclist, um, a passenger on a motorcycle, mobility scooters, powered wheelchairs, for example, bicycles, pedestrians, etc. Another key 
thing to note is that this doesn't apply if the claimant is a child at the time of bringing the claim. However, one thing to note is that the injuries will still be valued by reference to the tariff system. It just can't proceed under this protocol and this process. Uh, and a similar provision happens if either the claimant or the defendant is or becomes a protected party. Um, you'll note sort of the similar provisions that exist at the moment um, that it can't proceed if the claimant is a bankrupt, for example, um, or if the vehicle is registered outside of the UK. A rather interesting one um, that has troubled both myself and Phil when we've looked into this is the explicit reference to Section 53 of the Health and Safety at Work Act, etc. Uh, 1974. And the reason um, that it has troubled us both is that um, when one actually looks at Section 53, it is a list essentially of definitions and it's quite unclear how a party could fall foul of that. Uh, and Phil has brought up a, a number of um, issues in respect of this and quite how it's been missed by those drafting this legislation uh, and these um, rules is unclear. Um, but Phil, perhaps you can um, explain a bit more about where our concerns were in respect of this provision. Yes, um, I mean, the obvious place to start is that if you're going to fall into a protocol for road traffic accidents, you would have to have a road traffic accident. Um, it's set out as such. So it's slightly unclear how you could fall into the employer's liability bracket dealing with health and safety at work and fit the definition for the protocol to apply anyhow. Um, and it's even more confusing when the example given, because there's there's a guidance document which has been published. I, I don't know if you're aware of it. If not, perhaps we could find a link and send that over to you all afterwards. Um, the guidance document gives an example where the claimant fell from a roof at work. Um, again, if a claimant falls from a roof at work, I really struggle to see how they fall within the protocol at all. It's completely unclear what this exclusion is designed to address. Um, if any of you have a better idea than me and Sophie, perhaps you want to type it in and you can give us answers instead of questions to deal with at the end. But it, it is unclear to us quite what this exclusion is targeted at. Um, so we're sorry, but we can't really help with that. And we had a good think about it. We even thought perhaps it was a typographical error and looked at section 5.3, but that doesn't help either. Um, so there really is no rhyme or reason to that exclusion as far as we can see, because it seems pretty implausible that you could have an accident which is caught both by the protocol and by that particular act. Um, I'll just deal with the final bullet point because whilst I'm talking, I might as well. Um, the protocol doesn't apply if you're under the untraced drivers agreement. Note specifically the untraced drivers agreement. If it's uninsured, then the MIB does pick it up through the portal. Um, so don't drop things out of the portal just because the MIB gets involved. It's only if it's untraced driver rather than uninsured. So um, we've already discussed um, the value of, of cases and when they would fall within this protocol, but other um, exclusions apply. Uh, and one of those is whether there are complex issues of law or fact. Um, again, this is somewhat puzzling in the sense that you would assume that if something was complex in terms of law or fact, that it wouldn't be caught under this protocol in any event. In respect of what is meant um, by that myself and Phil have again um, tried to think of um, essentially of situations which may arise which may fit that definition. Um, for example we thought of perhaps um, maybe in, in a very unusual case where there's a claim for provisional damages in future um, but, but one of the more confusing elements in parts of this case um, this sort of exclusion is perhaps what do we do in cases involving things like counterclaims? Um, 
that there's nothing within the wording of the protocol in terms of whether the defendant in its response can put forward in essence a counterclaim. Um, in addition, it seems that the only way at the moment that is envisaged by this process, if there is going to be a counterclaim, is that there would need to be a determination on liability. Uh, and it seems to me, and I'm sure Phil can um, can step in if he disagrees, that the only appropriate way of going forward with it on the current rules is that there would need to be a determination and drop out um, and then essentially go back through. But quite what will happen to that counterclaim isn't something that seems to be dealt with explicitly in either the practice direction or the pre-action protocol. And it's quite notable that there's no mention of counterclaims in, in the guidance that's been published um, for uh, litigants who are going to be using this service. Um, uh, and so therefore, I suspect that the only way that there might be to deal with this issue in, in cases involving counterclaims would be to for the defendant to essentially deny liability in full. Um, Phil, again, I'm not sure if you agree with me on that, but yes, it's it's an interesting one um, in that. In theory, you could negotiate contributory negligence between the two parties, but of course, contributory negligence actually is an issue of injury not of liability so for example there could be a 50 50 fault accident where the claimant gets injured and their damages could be reduced by more than 50 percent because to take the most obvious example they're also not wearing a seat belt which contributed um, and whilst it wasn't part of the cause of the accident it certainly was part of the cause of their injuries which they were at fault for but the only way I can see around having to take the whole the whole claim out of the process for a determination on liability to run your counterclaim would be if there could be a, a memorandum of understanding reached between the parties um, outside of the portal that whatever contributing negligence they negotiate is based on a, a fair proportion of liability as opposed to being solely related to the claimant's damages. But otherwise, the only way I can see to properly run a counterclaim if there really is a dispute um, where you accept perhaps some primary liability falls on you is to deny liability in full and then go before a court and get them to determine the issue. I, I can't see any other way to, to get around it. Um, Yes. So, so as Sophie says, that that I think is probably a complex issue, albeit it's not particularly complex one, um, sufficiently complex to get it out of this portal process. Another issue um, that's mentioned on on the screen and is something that's considered to be separate as a complex issue of, uh, to a complex issue of law fact is that of allegations of fraud or fundamental dishonesty um, the defendant can of course uh, as they can in current proceedings raise this at any stage but the impact of this is that it will essentially drop the claim out of this process and will then be reallocated um, to the fast track. There are no rules within the port the protocol in terms of um, when or how this is to be made, but I do think a key thing to note is that there is an onus on the defendant in those circumstances when they're setting out um, why the case isn't suitable, particularly if they're saying that it's unsuitable because of an allegation of fundamental dishonesty, that they are to raise those allegations on the portal itself um, and again myself and Phil ha have spoken at length about uh, about this and the difficulty that this poses particularly for defendants um, and why we think that ultimately this protocol perhaps isn't fit for the purpose for which it was intended for i.e to reduce fraud because um, on our interpretation on our looking at the rules a defendant will need to ensure that they've got a pretty good case in terms of fundamental dishonesty um, given that it will fall out of this regime and into uh, into the fast track where we know the costs will be will be different and will be more significant uh, Phil I don't know if you have anything further that you want to, to add in respect of that I think the only 
the only observation I would make is one of my pet peeves at the bar is um, the sort of token allegation of fundamental dishonesty, which hitherto has been rife simply because there's no downside to defendants. So I think this is in part intended to address that. Um, so you don't see the pleading of fundamental dishonesty on the basis that someone told the expert their injuries were moderate, but told their GP their injuries were middling. Um, you see these sort of allegations thrown and then perhaps the more scrupulous and, and nervy claimants panic and accept lower settlements. Um, so I suspect in part this is designed to give a downside um, to poor allegations of fundamental dishonesty. But I suspect actually it's gone too far the other way now in that you can have very legitimate concerns but still, I imagine it would be quite difficult to persuade insurers that they want to run dishonesty cases because they're probably going to have to succeed relatively frequently to make it worth doing. Um, and when I say relatively frequently, I, I imagine it in a majority to make it financially worthwhile, particularly when one considers the tariffs are now particularly low as well. Um, simply paying it off and paying the sort of token costs that you would you would have to pay would, would seem to me to be financially the better option. Um, will it deter fraud going forwards? Maybe because it's not as lucrative to fraudsters. Um, but on the flip side, I think it's going to be easier to get away with a fraud if you were to perpetrate it, because I don't think anyone's want to, going to want to call you out because it just costs too much money. Um, so that I guess that's my tuppence on that issue. Um, be interesting to see how it is going forwards. Um, I suspect many of you watching have have more of an inkling as to what your insurer clients, if you're on the defendant side, are likely to do with this process going forwards. But it's certainly something where I suspect some statistics are going to be gathered by a big insurer, and then they're just going to make a sweeping policy decision at some point. Um, but I'll be interested to see how it goes. Yeah, and tying into that is uh, is the issue of LVI. So there's an option, and we'll come on to this a little bit later in our slides, um, for essentially an ad a partial admission in the sense that you can admit that um, that the defendant caused the accident, but deny that that resulted in any injury. So uh, again, a sort of partial admission. And one of the um, issues there is that this allegation is usually raised after um, putting in evidence on the defendant's side to be considered by the medical expert. And then following that, if the defendant wishes to continue with that allegation that the accident has not caused any injury, then again, this is something that will need to, to leave this, this process and this protocol. Um, and it's but at that point, the claim has already proceeded at least part way through it uh, and have already gone through the expense and time of obtaining that evidence. Um, so it, it's interesting to see how, particularly in cases involving LVI, for example, how those will fall in, in terms of this pro protocol or whether it might be more beneficial from the outset uh, to at least continue through this as a cost saving exercise. But um, but the LVI cases in particular are covered in, in some detail in terms of the, the protocol and the rules in there. There's also the issue of in terms of liability. Um, if liability is denied in full, then the claimant can simply issue proceedings for a determination on liability. There's a specific rules and protocol um, for that as well. Uh, and then essentially the court is asked to make a decision. And if there is a finding full of partial liability, then the case essentially picks back up through the portal process after that and continues on through the valuation um, through the normal steps that way. Um, Phil mentioned earlier about non-protocol vehicle costs, uh, and I think he will set out now what those entail and how we deal with those in the context of this portal. Um. Yes, I think this will be fairly brief, I suspect it's fairly logical. Um, examples of vehicle costs, we only include this here, I mean it's pretty obvious what a vehicle cost is because they are set out explicitly in the in the protocol, um, but your pre-accident value, repairs, excess, hire cars, um, presumably recovery and storage charges, apologies for our typographical error. Um, yes, and in order to be a protocol cost, 
the claimant has to have paid it personally or an individual have paid it on their behalf. Um, we did briefly consider whether an individual paying it on their behalf could mean uh, another corporate body, but we think the use of the word individual is, is designed very much to exclude that, to exclude there being a sort of loophole where you can get a company to pay off your um, your higher charges, for example. Um, I could see a system whereby perhaps credit hire organisations might try and, and sort it through a personal loan of some sort or some sort of offer of money described as a personal loan to get around. It'd be interesting to see what happens there. They're always quite creative. Um, but effectively, it has to be something that you've paid or, or you're going to pay personally or has been paid by your sister, your brother, your partner, your mum, uh, any other individual you wish to identify. Um, next point just makes that clear. Um, so you'd be a protocol cost if um, pre-accident value is claimed by you personally and you're not paying it off to an insurer. Um, again, repairs, you would have to pay for them personally. So uh, the sort of credit repair schemes you see, that would then be a non-protocol cost. If you took it to your local garage, you're within the protocol. Um, the final bullet point just sets out the opposite. Um, so if you don't fall within that definition, unsurprisingly, you're going to be a non-protocol cost. Um, the importance of, of non-protocol costs versus protocol costs is uh, non-protocol costs don't go into calculating the value of the claim for the purposes of the portal. Um, but once you're outside of the portal, uh, they all get added back in. So you could have significant non-protocol vehicle costs, um, trivial injuries, fall outside of the portal and suddenly find yourself within the fast track, if not even the multi-track, if you have sufficient vehicle costs. Um, the important thing to note for the portal is that you have to set out what your non-protocol vehicle costs are going to be on the portal, even though they can't be resolved through the portal. Um, so you have to let the insurer, the defendant know um, what those costs are going to be going forwards. Um, little more to say on that, it's relatively common sense. <laughs> Um, yeah, just just one thing to add from that, as Phil has already said, that in terms of valuing the case, they're not included. It's preferable that they're put on the portal and who that money is owed to and how that's being recouped. Um, but in terms of when you come to or if the claimant has to come to issue the case because of non-settlement or um, because of a, an issue in terms of liability, then it is essential that those costs do be added in. Otherwise, um, you can find yourself falling foul and not having um, included that in the total settlement or the total um, sums that are awarded. Um, and there are specific forms that are provided in the pre-action protocol with um, annexes that need to be completed in the cases where there are non-protocol vehicle costs. Um, so moving forward then in terms of the basic um, procedure on the liability standpoint, so you'll note that there is a very short time scale for the defendant to provide their response on liability, so notably within 30 days of the claim being accepted on the portal. Um, if the claim is being dealt with by the MIB, that time is, is 40 days. Um, and a key matter here, uh, and something which may po pose some difficulty, is if the claim is originally dealt with by the MIB, but they then pass it on to an insurer, there is no extension of that 40 day time limit. Um, so that can put defendants under um, some real time pressure on that side of things. Another key change here, um, particularly when we compare it to the current protocol, is that unless the defendant responds within that timescale, um, they're taken to admit liability in full, um, rather than in the current procedure where the claim simply drops out of the portal. Um, and that's important because you'll note from the bullet point further below that the defendant is able to withdraw an admission in certain circumstances. However, the pre-action protocol 
explicitly excludes cases in which um, an ad you're taken to admit because of a failure to respond. So that admission continues through. You don't even fall into the circumstances where you might be able to withdraw an admission, say that the claimant suffered an injury. And so it, it's important that timescales are, are strictly adhered to, particularly on the defendant side of things, because um, you don't want to be taken to admit uh, and deprive yourself of the opportunity of raising a, an argument later down the line. Another important procedural um, thing to note is if the claim is, um, if liability is denied and the issues are then needing to be taken forward to a hearing. There is a, a small claim notification form that is produced by the portal and it is imperative that the claimant or their representative um, ensure that the defendant receives that uh, and that's also explicitly dealt with in the protocol itself. As a, a as a continuation on that, Phil will now address you on issues in terms of contested liability. Um, yes, li liability is a little bit different in um, in the new portal from the old portal because liability being contested doesn't take you outside of it per se, um, as Sophie's explained. Um, so when the claimant puts something onto the portal or puts their claim onto the portal to begin with. Um, they can upload any evidence they choose effectively in support of that. That could be sketches, little videos, um, pictures, uh, all of the above can be added on. Um, and at the point where liability comes to be contested, um, the court will take that evidence into account. Um, if the evidence hasn't been uploaded at the portal stage, then it's up to the court whether or not they accept that evidence. Um, Practically speaking, given you're going into the small claims track, which can be the wild, wild west, uh, and it's difficult to see how a judge would look to refuse, for example, photos from post-accident showing positions of vehicle or damage when it's going to obviously help their decision. Um, it's difficult for me to see how they're going to refuse to look at that evidence. Um, when deciding who's at fault for a road traffic accident on the small claims track. So I suspect there will be quite a lot of leeway um, and I suspect that is envisaged in the use of the word may when it says the court may refuse um, or may not allow that evidence in. So I suspect the reality is there will be quite slack, um, but don't rely on it. Um, different judges, of course, are different personas. Um, I suppose it follows, given the evidence is going on and going to go before the court, the claimant's required to sign a statement of truth, a bit unusual in a portal system, which is pre-action. Um, but if the evidence is effectively going to run through into a court hearing, it stands to reason if the claimant's putting their version of events on the portal, um, they should be bound by them and should stick with them. I effectively, what the portal's doing is re replacing your statement of case. Um, at an early stage, you set out what you say happened, you put a statement of truth on it. Uh, seems so logical. Um, and then defendants get to look at claimants' evidence. If they're going to deny liability, then they can't just put a bold denial in. Um, they have to set out again why they deny, what they say happened, and again, statement of truth. Effectively, we're doing initial pleadings through the portal. Um, it it seems relatively sensible, except that you're doing pleadings without a, any proceedings having formally ever been started. Um, I suppose it's more akin to a, a being bound by your letter of claim and letter of response, um, which you've then formally signed. Um, a little bit of an odd process, but it, it seems to make sense to me looking at it. Um, I can't envisage there being any great difficulties with it, provided judges are sensible about the upload of evidence and whether they accept evidence which hasn't been uploaded. Um, there's a guide that if a matter is going to be taken out of a portal, any evidence relied on should be uploaded 10 days before the matter is taken out of the portal for a determination on liability. Again, that's not hard and fast. Um, if evidence is uploaded and the matter is taken out of the portal the very next day, um, 
I think it's, well, it would be difficult to see what a judge is going to say about that unless a defendant turns up in trial and says, yes, absolutely, we admit liability in full and we would have done if we'd seen that evidence, but we just didn't have enough time. Um, if it remains contested, I can't see a, a judge saying anything other than all roads lead to Rome. Um, so there seems to be a bit of slack there, um, which remains to be seen how it's exercised. But I imagine courts will be very lenient because I can't see any incentive for them to be otherwise. Um, One word of caution that I um, that I would add is that the the pre-action protocol itself in terms of where you are putting forward a, a denial of liability or even a partial denial that those versions of events that are put forward alongside that and evidence must be signed by the defendant um, and it explicitly mentions that it must be signed by the defendant if you're unable to obtain that evidence at that stage there is provision in the pre-action protocol to essentially put forward a witness state, a witness summary, um, where the compensator, i.e., the RTA insurer or the MIB, has been unable, um, for good reason, to to obtain a signed version within the thirty day period, um, and that is the only circumstance in which the statement of truth can be signed by the compensator under the pre action protocol. But it still encourages parties to put forward essentially those. Um, that that full version of events supported by the statement of truth signed by the defendant um, as soon as they are able to do so. And so if you do put in a witness summary um, because you've been unable to obtain that that full version of events during that time scale, um, be mindful that you will still have to put forward this full response um, as required by the, the pre-action protocol. So it, it is a little bit more onerous on the defendant, in my view, in terms of putting forward their full version of events at quite an early stage in, in, in proceedings um, and essentially supporting that with a statement of truth. I suppose worth adding at this point, if you go to a determination on liability, provided the issues on quantum are fairly narrow, I would have thought any pragmatic judge is likely to want to deal with those there and then. Um, particularly if you only have a tariff injury. If you have a tariff injury and a couple of heads of loss which seem to be in dispute rather than pushing everyone back into the portal and then potentially coming back to court to resolve it again at a later date, it may be that pragmatic judges or pragmatic parties even would say, well, let's just sort it out now. Let's grab the bull by the horns and be done. Um, be aware of that. Um, it may well be a good way of getting things dealt with more quickly than they otherwise would. Um, so dealing very briefly then on, on interim payments and the importance of interim payments in respect of, uh, of this protocol, um, which can be dealt with very quickly, provided, of course, there's an admission or a partial admission, the claimant can request an interim payment at any stage, but the defendant can also offer to cover specific protocol damages. Um, and provided those are agreed and those sums are satisfied, if it relates to a specific cost, for example, the excess, and that's paid in full, then in essence, that is satisfied and is removed from the claim and the court cannot order that sum to be repaid. If the claimant seeks a more general interim payment, um, for example, a thousand pounds, they should set out um, how that's broken down in terms of any tariff injuries um, and other protocol losses. But those are subject to the usual rules in that the court can order that to be repaid in circumstances. Um, so using interim payments in this regard can actually be quite a useful tactical tool in order to essentially knock off parts of the claim um, without it needing to be determined because they can be satisfied essentially in full. Um, Phil, I don't know if you have anything further to, to add on Yes, that. I was going to say the obvious use for that is because you know what the non-protocol um, vehicle damages or vehicle heads of loss are going to be. Uh, if you're a defendant and you knock off a couple of, of token heads of loss and get yourself down below the fast track limit by knocking those out once you add back in those non-protocol vehicle costs, then if the matter gets outside of the portal, well, you're, you're still within the small claims track. Um, so that would seem to be the, the tactical way of using it. Um, 
as Peter's just pointed out in the chat, there seems to be a very small number of circumstances that will attract costs. Uh, yes, in, in short, yes, which is why we, we postulated earlier about what the court was going to do with colder bank offers and considering conduct unreasonable. Um, it, if defendants start simply running everything on the basis, well, we might as well have a stab, it costs tuppence to do so. Um, courts may get weary of that rather quickly when they find themselves bogged down with hundreds and hundreds of small claims. Um, so it may be that they start to, to take uh, fairly or give defendants fairly short shrift for running pointless arguments and pointless uh, defences. But we will see how that goes. So we mentioned earlier about um, the injuries. We, we've gone through liability, um, particularly disputes, uh, and the use of, uh, of interim payments in order to, to mit mitigate liability going forward. Um, but the unusual um, thing that has been brought in by these regulations is, of course, the definition of a whiplash injury uh, and how the tariffs have uh, will apply to that. You'll note uh, on the screen there that we've put in the section from the Civil Liability Act, and you'll also note that the damage is confined to injury in the neck, back or shoulder. And as Phil set out in his example earlier, if there was a, an injury to the foot, for example, that clearly wouldn't fall within this definition here. But this definition will be important, particularly when we come to consider um, using the tariffs uh, and how to use those tariffs going forward. But before we get to um, valuing the injuries, of course, we've got the issue of the medical report. We've already set out that the first report must be obtained um, from a from a GP, a fixed cost medical report. The portal is is essentially now linked with Medco, um, so an unrepresented claimant should still um, should still utilise the Medco service to get their report. Another thing that we touched on uh, and will be key for defendants where in cases involving, for example, partial admissions or, for example, where they dispute that the accident was um, sufficient to cause injury, um, the defendant's version of events should also be sent on to the expert so that the expert can comment on, on any sort of prognosis or, or diagnosis in light of, um, of those two versions of events essentially giving the defendant the opportunity to have the expert um, consider that. Um, of course, that, that's unlikely to be necessary in cases in which liability is admitted or there's no dispute, um, but this would also include scenario where um, there's an allegation of contributory negligence for failing to wear a seatbelt, for example. That is something that should be put before the expert and the expert should be asked to comment on that. Following receipt of the first medical report, of course, um, you, you can go on to obtain further reports, um, but it's essential that those are justified uh, and we will touch on, on, on what is justified and the impact of that in a second. Um, and similarly, it's anticipated that a review of medical records will be very infrequent indeed in terms of medical reporting. And again, um, in terms of any fees, including medical records fees, those too um, must be justified. Um, you'll note there as well that once the reports have been obtained and they've been sent over to the compensator on the portal, at this point, the claimant cannot challenge the factual accuracy of the report anymore. Um, they can't do that on the portal. They're taken to accept it. Um, but they can actually sort of challenge that through the portal itself or send to the defendant um, what it, what the claimant says is inaccurate if the expert has refused to make amendments, for example. But just coming back briefly then in terms of the um, whether further reports are going to be justified, again, the portal is quite explicit in the circumstances that it says um, says are reasonable for um, for a claimant to go and obtain additional medical evidence. Um, and those include, for example, 
if they um, if it's, if it's recommended in the report, if there's a period of time of which there should be um, a waiting for medical symptoms or treatment to alleviate, or for example, if the claimant is still continuing to suffer from their injuries um, beyond beyond that period of, of prognosis. Uh, and a key thing here is in terms of the further medical reports, these can be obtained at, at any time, including during the offers phase, which is explicitly mentioned by the pre-action protocol. So that envisages a scenario where the claimant has uploaded, say, a GP report, has invited offers, um, but then decides to go and obtain, for example, an orthopaedic report, and there is nothing preventing them in the rules. Um, to do that, that, that's something that they can do. Um, similar to current provisions, if they do go on to obtain that second report, say an ortho or an A&E report, then those again should be through the fixed costs, um, medical report rules and through Medco. Um, but an interesting thing here is that the defendant can, in certain circumstances, raise an objection to the second report being obtained, um, i.e. the defendant can say that it doesn't think that a further report is justified, but it needs to link that to the reasons um, that are set out in the pre-action protocol. So, for example, um, if they dispute that, that, that it's necessary or has been recommended by another expert. In terms of um, if the defendant does raise an objection, if the defendant was required under the protocol to arrange a further medical report um, requested by the claimant and, and doesn't do so in time or raises an unreasonable objection, um, then there are, it's been stipulated that this is something that is likely to amount to unreasonable behaviour under Rule 24 um, at 27.14. I'll wrap it up shortly then. Um, I think it was Erin's question. You, yeah, in circumstances, you can go straight to an ortho if you have non-whiplash injuries and they can, for example, comment on the whiplash injuries. Um, but the, the pre-action protocol does set out that the first report should be um, fixed cost medical report obtained through Medco. So there's no restriction on you doing that. But I suppose the normal process would be to go to the GP and they would then refer you onward um, for ortho if that was something that they felt that they needed to do. I'm just going to try and get back the, the slides. OK, so I think have had we finished sort of the, the the medical reporting side of things when you lost me? Yes, I, yeah, we yeah. were through that and you were just answering Erin's question when we lost you. So we can proceed on to valuing injuries. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the tariffs. We've got them on the next slide, um, so we'll show them to you in a second. Um, substantially lower than the existing Judicial College guidelines brackets. Um, the interesting question, I suppose, is what happens if you fall outside or above the tariff? Uh, the tariffs are so substantially lower uh, than the Judicial College guidelines um, that if you had a whiplash injury that was, to take the most narrow example, 25 months, do you suddenly fall within the Judicial College guidelines as they are currently and your award jumps from about £4,000 to about £8,000 for the sake of being injured for another month? Or are courts going to look at the tariffs and say, well, you fall just above the tariffs, so we're going to give you a slightly above tariff amount of money? Um, I suspect the answer is the Judicial College guidelines will be revised and there will be a chapter within or, or a bracket within uh, orthopaedic injuries which deals solely with whiplash style injuries um, and I suspect we will see that come in fairly shortly and be linked somewhat to the tariffs. Um, it's always difficult I suppose with a tariff as opposed to with giving courts discretion because different judges may view them differently. Um, some some courts may well view them as, well, that's a tariff. It applies in the very strict circumstances where it applies, where it doesn't. I'm going to go back to Old Faithful and use my Judicial College guidelines. Um, again, it's one of those things which is a little bit going to be trial and error. We just don't know the answer yet. It remains to be seen. But my, my suspicion is that we will see revised Judicial College guidelines um, coming in to deal solely with, with whiplash injuries. Um, as you'd expect, 
other accidents, other injuries still valued with reference to the Judicial College guidelines. No reason for that to have changed. Um, what is unclear, as the next point makes out, is what if we have some sort of overlap between injuries? Um, so you can fall. Uh, uh, just to quickly address that, um, Pete's just put in the chat, if you have a, a wrist or knee injury, if mine are along with the whiplash, you fall out the portal. You don't. Um, you would still be within the portal. Um, provided the the combined total of your injuries didn't take you above the five thousand pound limit, um, there is scope for other injuries to fall within the portal as well, not just whiplash injuries. Um, an interesting question is, well, if you have a tariff whiplash injury and a non-tariff injury, which is broadly similar, so if, for example, you had neck, shoulder, and right arm, um, one would have thought that that is essentially one injury, but you don't fall within the tariff. So do you get given your tariff sum for the whiplash element and then a full sum for the right arm? Do you get an uplift for the right arm? Do you go solely into the Judicial College guidelines at that point with the court saying, well, it's one injury that isn't by the tariff and therefore we'll use the, the guidelines to value it? It's not quite clear. It's going to be trial and error. No doubt different people will use different interpretations to begin with. Um, eventually it will probably settle down. I imagine it will end up being a common sense, well, there's your tariff and I'm going to give you an uplift um, would be the logical thing to do, I would have thought. Um, and again, that process would only be hastened if the Judicial College guidelines get amended, um, because then you have the whiplash tariffs sort of enshrined therein um, and then uplifting them seems less, less objectionable to, to judges, I would have thought. Um, as we've already said, if you're outside of um, the tariffs, for an injury, then you can make an offer whenever you want. Um, uh, yes, the medical expert would say if it was one injury, um, it, still it's interesting to think how a court might choose to assess it. Um, Michelle, interesting point, I don't know is the answer. Um, it would be a very sophisticated fraud, um, would be very clever um, if someone added on extra injuries to try and make it fall outside of the portal. But the only way you do it is to get over £5,000, at which point you're in the fast track anyway. And then the allegation of fundamental dishonesty will be much as it is currently. You're basically in the present system if that happens. Um, so. Here, clearly, we've just dragged up the tariffs. Um, I suppose the only obvious thing to note is that they're much lower than they would previously have been. Um, so a couple of things which we wanted to briefly discuss um, about the tariffs. Firstly, the left-hand column, um, if you look actually above, I suppose, the damage is 2-1, a, the total amount of damages for pain, suffering and loss of immediately payable in relation to one or more whiplash injuries taken together. Um, so which would suggest that you get the same amount of money if you have a neck injury, a neck shoulder injury, a neck shoulder and back injury. Um, which seems somewhat arbitrary and somewhat unfair, but there you are. Um, but what that does raise a question of, and we'll come on to exceptional circumstances in a second, is whether having multiple sites essentially, so neck, back and shoulder, makes you exceptional. Um, I wouldn't have thought so, but we can, we'll can we we'll discuss that a little bit more in a second. Um, the other interesting thought on one or more whiplash injuries taken together is if you have this scenario, which you see with moderate frequency, where someone was to be involved in an initial road traffic accident get given a prognosis of say six months and within that prognosis it prognosis period suffer a second accident and get given another prognosis um, do you just take the two accidents together and say all right so in total you had whiplash injuries for for argument's sake nine months or do you say well the first in the first accident was six months you get six months for that one the second accident was exacerbation for a couple of months, but then lingering symptoms for another, say, four months. You get six months again. You get two lots of six months or do you just get them added together? 
it's not quite clear at present. Um, I do wonder whether that's going to be one of those complex scenarios which makes you fall outside the portal perhaps for the second accident because there's that overlap. Um, unclear at present how that's going to be dealt with. Uh, now if I turn to the two columns, left column no minor psychological injury, right column there is a minor psychological injury. Uh, it, it's got to be travel anxiety because as soon as you get a formal psychiatric diagnosis it would be foolish to put yourself through the portal um, and have it just as a minor psychological injury because you get no money for it. Um, if you had a, a properly diagnosed specific phobia which lasted six months, um, then you wouldn't want to be going through this particular portal. You would just ignore the whiplash altogether and claim it as a six month psychological injury and you'd get far more than the £520 you'd get out of the portal. Um, so minor psychological injury, it seems to me, can only mean travel anxiety, because if it's anything else, you would just ignore the whiplash and pretend it never happened. Um, so it can only be travel anxiety. In terms of that, I think it also raises an interesting question in terms of given that these injuries are taken essentially together, that if you have a, a neck injury that lasts around three months, but um, just some general travel anxiety, which has a prognosis of around six months, what bracket would that, that be in? I think the logical answer would that it would fall to be determined by the physical injury and then you would just have the uplift added in 2-1-B rather than looking at the duration separately of the of the psychological injury. Um, but I, I agree with Phil, it can only be cases of essentially travel anxiety and shock where you've not got a, a recognised psychiatric disorder which would fall to be um, fall within these th these tariffs and these guidelines and that once you are over that threshold that that essentially gets determined in line with the um, Judicial College guidelines as well. Um, Phil touched on earlier about the, the uplift in exceptional circumstances and, and we know that these injuries are taken together, um, which does raise the interesting question of if a claimant suffers with a neck, back and shoulder injury, whether that would be something that would be considered to be um, exceptionally severe, so as to warrant uh, an uplift on the tariff. Um, I, I agree with Phil that it seems that that would be counterintuitive, um, particularly to the wording um, of the tariffs, if by having multi-site essentially whiplash injuries that that would that would render it um, exceptionally severe and rather unhelpfully there's no guidance as you can imagine as to what those circumstances might entail or whether the severity of the injury um, so that they had short-lived symptoms but were very severe in their presentation whether that would be something that would be exceptionally severe but but in circumstances um, the claimant can seek up to 20 percent of the tariff amount and it's important that that's acknowledged um, it's not just a blanket 20 percent and the claimant is required to state the percentage which they do seek if they are seeking an uplift on the tariff, be that 5, 10, 15 or 20 percent or something in the middle. Uh, and another onus which is on the claimant here is in cases where they are instructing um, medical experts and when they're putting their injuries onto the portal, they should state um, if they consider um, that, that their injuries are exceptional, exceptionally severe or, or how they say the circumstances are exceptional to enable the medical expert to determine um, uplift but for it also to be considered when negotiating in terms of whether there is likely to be a, an additional amount awarded in respect of those. Um, so the, the terrain in terms of what would constitute exceptional circumstances is one which is really open for argument at the moment um, and I think will largely come down to um, how medical experts when they're producing their report um, what they consider to be exceptionally severe because it is something that needs to be covered within that report. Um, Phil I don't know if you ha have anything further um, that you wanted to add in respect of that. Um, 
I find it a little bit odd, I must say, um, that it falls to the medical experts to determine whether or not a, a, a whiplash injury is exceptionally severe. Um, in part, it's the idea that the medical expert makes that determination, which makes me think it's very unlikely you're ever going to find exceptionally severe whiplash injury, because there seems to me to be nothing exceptional about a whiplash injury which affects your neck, your shoulder and your back. They're ten a penny, we see them all the time. Um, so that exceptionally severe um, criteria to get you your uplift, um, I just can't see ever biting. I think it's very, very difficult to think of a scenario in which that will bite. Um, but you may end up just getting some very claimant friendly doctors. I don't know. We will find out. Um, so we've seen a lot of questions in the chat and perhaps if myself and Phil um, and anyone else who from Chambers um, who's on the call um, what wants to chip in and, uh, and help us answer those. But we'll, I think if we start at start at the top. Um, oh, whilst we're on tariffs, perhaps that's the best place to start. There were lots of questions about are these tariffs going to apply to X, Y, Z situation where we don't fall um, wholly within um, this new new protocol. Um, my reading of the regulations is that they will apply to any whiplash injury. Um, it's perhaps important to point out the tariffs themselves are not contained in the same legislation as the protocol. The protocol, as we saw, was contained in the, um, the Civil Liability Act. The regulations which contain the tariffs are completely separate. Um, they don't seem to suggest that your whiplash injury would need to be caused by a qualifying road traffic accident for portal purposes for the tariffs to apply. However, the sort of the brief summary of what the regulations are, which don't actually form a binding part of the regulations, do say that they're intended to apply to RTA cause whiplash injuries. Um, so clear as mud on the drafting, um, but it seems to me the regulations probably apply to all whiplash injuries. And even if they don't, I suspect courts are going to take the view very shortly that, well, if that's what you get for a whiplash from an RTA, why should you get substantially more from a whiplash from, I don't know, for example, falling over at work on a slippy floor. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. And I suspect it will all be dealt with fairly shortly anyhow, in that I imagine the Judicial College guidelines will be updated to give brackets, which are the equivalent of the tariffs. Um, I would be surprised if they don't, because it would seem to be grossly unfair and unjust to have more money for one injury as opposed to another based on where and how it was caused. Um, I think that addresses quite a number of the questions at the start, um, but we can now perhaps have a work through. Um, yeah, there was a, a question about whether the tariff would apply to the MIB untraced drivers agreement. Um, I, I think Phil has already covered that um, that there doesn't seem to be sort of uh, any express exclusion to other parts of um, of the protocol. I think if your case is um, a whiplash injury that meets that definition, then it can afford to be determined um, in line with the tariffs. And I and I also anticipate that there will be an update from the Judicial College guidelines setting out um, how those tariffs are going to apply um, more broadly. Um, I, I think Erin had a question as to whether um, the portal would apply to bankrupt claimants and defendant vehicles registered outside the UK. Um, no, it doesn't. You would fall outside of the regime um, in those circumstances and your claim couldn't continue um, through the sort of small claims protocol in those circumstances, probably because it would be considered an issue of um, complex law or fact. Um, I, I suppose in terms of the bankruptcy side of things that can present difficulties in claims going forward. So it would typically fall out in those circumstances. Um, I'm just working my way through. There's a comment from Kate Golding about how she can't see how the day after the accident you can foresee that an injury is going to resolve within two years, which I agree with. Um, and what should you do? Uh, I suspect the reality is you have some steer as to what sort of injury your claimant has. Um, and you put it within the portal, you get your initial medical report. If your initial medical report turns around and says, oh, this is far worse than you thought, 
then at that point you can just jump out. You, you're not you're not stuck within this portal once you're in there. Um, the exceptions which stop it going in the portal to begin with, perhaps we should have been clear earlier, we were perhaps a bit ambiguous. Um, if any of those come to apply during the process, so for example, your injuries which you thought were fairly trivial turn out to be very significant, um, perhaps you develop some sort of chronic pain, I don't know, um, such that suddenly PSLA is going to be wildly over £5,000, well, you just take it out of the portal. Um, so the answer is you use your you use your intuition and your best guess at the start. Um, if in doubt, probably stick it in the portal because otherwise you're going to get in trouble down the road with costs probably. Um, and at the point where you can say, actually, I think this is going to fall out now, you just tug it out and proceed normally. Um, importantly, the portal, I suppose we should say the portal isn't proceedings. Um, by putting it on the portal, you haven't issued proceedings, liability, uh, liability limitation, the clock is still running. Um, so that's the only thing you need to be careful of. Um, uh, going down to the bottom because we seem to be getting some questions in now. Concern is sometimes experts says injury will resolve within X months and then it doesn't. Um, Yes, I suppose that's an issue you come up up against anyhow, in that if you have an expert says, well, your whiplash will resolve in 12 months total, you settle the matter after six months and then, you know, 15 months down the line, your claimant says, I've still got pain. Well, it, it's all a little bit late by then. Um, in this situation, if you've got an expert that says it's going to settle in, in a certain time and it doesn't, you're in the same situation you're in currently. Um, it's just one of those things we all have to do our best with our crystal balls, I think. Um, I think one thing which actually we missed potentially under exceptional circumstances, we talked about exceptionally severe injury, um, but you can also appeal um, to your circumstances being exceptional. Oh, gosh, apologies. Um, Karen, I'll come to you next. I think apparently you have your hand up. Um, Exceptional circumstances are far easier to work out than exceptionally severe injuries. Um, you just appeal to the judge's heart and, you know, play your, your tiny violin and, and say particular loss of amenity. I don't know. You, you had your wedding the week after and you had a whiplash injury and in all your photos you're tilted to one side. Um, so you'd like an uplift for that. It, it's that sort of thing. It's easy to see how you might get your 20 percent uplift for that. Um, Karen, you have your hand up. Um, you can speak if you want to ask a question verbally. Um, is your hand intentionally up? I know I sometimes stick my hand up in these things accidentally. It, it, yeah, um, for some reason I, I can't write in the chat since I got booted out and rejoined. Um, so it was, Sorry about that. That's fine. It was just a quick question regarding interim because I, I kind of missed the entire <clears throat> the entire slide so interims can be requested at any stage um as as is now um can you just go over that bit or just put the slide back up again just so i can see what the the position was what the dependents can do or or can't do um okay fine so interim payments are you can ask for interim payments at any time. Effectively, if a defendant says this interim payment is for that head of loss and an agreed sum or the full sum and the claimant accepts it, then that's effectively taken to be settled. So it's not interim anymore. Um, you can offer their, their misnomer. It's a misnomer. They shouldn't be called interim payments because if you identify a specific head of loss and pay it off in full or for the agreed sum between the parties, it's settled. And it just leaves it leaves the process as it were. Um, so it wouldn't go before a court and it can't be changed. Um, if an interim payment is made generally, so if your claim totals, I don't know, for argument's sake, you've got a five thousand pound in total claim, and the defendant says, Oh, we'll give you two and a half for now, and we'll sort out the rest once the judge has had a look, um, then everything's to play for. 
there's no heads of loss specifically settled. So it's just an interim payment in the way that you or I would understand an interim payment to be. Um, it's just slightly sloppy use of language in the drafting in that interim payments for specific heads of loss for specified sums where the parties agree it's the correct sum. So it sounds a lot like settlement um, is called an interim payment for no obvious reason. OK, so if you are um, requesting an, an interim payment and you include treatment costs, uh, then the Fair Party Insurance Company agree the interim includes the treatment costs. Does that preclude you from then recovering any further costs in respect to treatment? Does that kind of shut the door on that? Um, so if, if there was a third party who had sorted out physio and were asking for costs, if, the, if between the claimant and defendant they agreed a sum for those treatment costs, which was then paid by way of an interim payment, which specifically said this interim payment is for treatment costs, then you're done on that. You can't add any more in. Um, if you were subsequently to have extra sessions of treatment, I don't know whether that's what your question was, was aimed yeah. at. Um, if you subsequently have more sessions of treatment, then as far as I'm concerned, that's not a loss you've claimed for because you've claimed for the sessions of treatment you've had to date. You're not, you haven't claimed for the sessions you're yet to have. Um, if you have extra sessions and subsequently they get added in, then I can't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to to claim for those. No, that that would be um, that would be very strange. I can't see that it would apply in that fashion um, because that's not what the interim payment was for. The parties didn't agree that you, they were paying for all treatment that might ever happen. It's for that treatment which you've claimed thus far. So we don't need to be careful with what we're adding in at the interim stage um, to potentially. My, my fear was that if we included treatment costs and then the client needed another six more sessions, we've shut the recovery off on, on that. Uh, no, I, I don't think that would be the case at all because you could you could get an interim payment for those sessions which you've had and which you've put on the portal. So I suppose one way to, to think about it is you could, in theory, put it on the portal as different heads of loss. You could put the first one on as, phys, you know, six sessions physio from X date to Y date. And you put the second loss of physio on as six sessions of physio from Z date to A date. Um, and then, you know, the interim payment specifically is for one head of loss as opposed to the other. Um, I, I can't see any issue with that. It's only us which likes to club it together in schedules of loss as treatment. There's no reason in theory why you couldn't break it all down into individual sessions if you really wanted, I suppose. There's another hand up. That's me, Phil, I think. Just going back to um, interims and thinking about a report where certainly if an, a medical report is obtained fairly swiftly, the prognosis might not be clear at that point. So an expert might very well say I would anticipate recovery within six to nine months. Yeah. Because still has the option at that point to provide that evidence to the defendant, confirm that it's accurate and say, I'd like to wait to see if I recover in line with that prognosis and claim a general interim on that basis. Uh, well, I mean, it's all in the claimant's hands because if the claimant wants, they could park the medical report and sit on it and just not disclose it. Because until they approve it, I don't think they have to disclose it. So presumably they could just sit on it. Um, but yes, I, I can't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to say, well, hang on, we want to wait a little bit. And um, the difficulty arises, of course, if your expert gives a very long prognosis and the court's likely to say, nah, sorry, let's get on with this. You know, I've got no interest in waiting that length of time. Um, but yes, I mean, you can, in theory, delay slightly getting your medical report. You could delay disclosing it. You could delay getting everything else on the portal ready to go. Um, by which point you'd be at that time anyway, and you could say, well, the injuries are ongoing, they're not. Mm. OK, so they don't have to disclose that report within currently, I think we've got 21 days to provide a report to a defendant once approved by a claimant. So they don't have the same sort of restriction that we currently have. Uh, I would have to double check. The, the um, claimant, I think, can so so the claimant can choose when that medical report is uploaded to the portal. But what you can do is you can put that 
report onto the portal and do as you sort of suggested, which is to say, look, this is our this is our medical report, but um, but we want to wait um, to see if we recover in line with our injuries. And that is something that is provided for within the current pre well, within the new pre-action protocol in any event. I think it does encourage parties to, to disclose the first report when they're happy with it. Um, I, again, I would have to check if you've got any sort of strict time limits in order to do so. But my understanding of it is, um, it, it is as Phil has set out, that you can obtain your medical report um, and, and at that point you can take the decision whether that's something you're going to send to the compensator and invite offers for or send to the compensator and essentially put a hold on things um, pending um, if any further medical evidence will be required in the prognosis uh, etc. Thank you. I just think it's just one way of protecting a claimant because obviously if they if they do go on and, and invite offers and achieve a settlement, but the symptoms carry on, they're stuck then, aren't they, with whatever settlement they've agreed? Uh, yes, and it's something as well in terms of this uh, quite an unusual locking system that's been put in place in this pre-action protocol that essentially once a step has been taken, it locks um, you into that step. But um, yeah, I, I see what you're saying in terms of essentially putting that evidence out there, but not being ready or, or in, in a position to be able to settle at that stage. Um, do you then compromise yourself? Um, and I don't think that, that the protocol suggests that you do. I think you, you still have it open to you to put that on the protocol, uh, on the portal, um, and not necessarily have to engage in negotiations straight away. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, interesting question um, from Hina. Do claims that fall out of this new portal have to be resubmitted to the MOJ portal if the value remains under £25,000? I don't know is the answer to that. Um, I wouldn't have thought so because I would have thought that once you have gone through one um, pre-action protocol you wouldn't be required to go through effectively another um, but I'm not sure on that that's an interesting question I haven't seen it addressed anywhere specifically but I would have thought once you fall out uh, I can help that y yes it, it does essentially pick up through the normal protocol that it, the existing one um, and that's been covered in some of the amendments that have been made to the existing um, pre-action protocol. I think it picks up um, at a certain point in, in that process though um, but the, there are um, the existing protocol has some pending amendments to it to allow for that to happen where a case that falls out of the small claims protocol provided it doesn't exceed the protocol upper limit so the the, the twenty five thousand pound essentially um it can pick up through the existing one i'm just trying to find the uh the provision that says that but but i do recall um reading about that Uh, there's a question about if claimants obtain a, an expert report before the defendant's response and the defendant subsequently makes comments on circumstances that must be sent to the expert, will the system allow for an addendum and who would be responsible for the cost? I think it's unlikely that situation is going to arise because liability would be sorted first of all and any circumstance the defendant wanted to raise I would have thought they would need to raise at that stage if they would missed the point or missed the time at which they need to raise particular circumstances um, then the way the portal functions they're taken to admit um, effectively everything so I think it would be difficult to see that situation arising. I suspect an addendum report wouldn't be difficult to obtain because I think you could just it, it would just fall under the usual can it be justified? Um, and 
fixed costs would apply as they do presently to it, um, who would be responsible for the cost, uh, argue it in front of a judge is probably the answer to that. It depends on the circumstances in which the need for it has arisen. Um, if through the defendant only making some sort of comment very late on that they should have made very early doors, uh, then I dare say they're going to bear the cost of it, um, which seems to be the, the premise of the question. Uh, I don't know if Sophie wants to add anything on that. Um, no, I don't. I think that sort of um, sort of covers that. I've noticed um, Sophie Hamilton has her hand up. Um, Sophie, do, do you have a question that you want to ask? Um, yes, please. So with a vulnerable road user, does that mean you just use the old portal and the small claim the limit is £1,000 for general damages? Uh, yeah. Going to the original portal has nothing to do with this at all. Um, yes, yeah, so if they're a vulnerable road user or in fact a child, um, then you then you would use the existing, um, it seems to be that you, you'd still use the existing schema and that it would be yeah, a thousand pound limit, hence why it would fall out of the small claims, um, the small claims. That's my understanding from reading um, reading the rules anyway, as someone will surely correct me if I'm wrong on that. Thank you. Um, the other thing was, is there any time limit to start in the new portal? So if people are concerned about their injuries not lasting two years or whatever, or lasting more than two years, can you leave it for two years and then start your claim? Or is there any sort of penalty for doing that? You can wait as long as you want. Um, the only time limit is limitation. Um, as mm -hmm. we said, the portal doesn't stop the limitation clock from running. So in theory, you could start two years and 364 days you go into the portal but you just need to make sure you issue proceedings at the same time uh, and stay them for limitation purposes so there's no reason why you would have to go straight away into the portal okay thank you um I'm just having I think we've answered quite a few of these questions um but does it does anyone have anything before we sort of um wrap this up um i I've just seen an interesting question from peter i can't remember if, if we addressed it but he has put if the value is more than five thousand but duration is less than two years is this still portal um in those circumstances would probably fall out because it's the psla value of five thousand has exceeded so it would fall out in those circumstances um anyway OK, I think that's that's everything. Um, so I guess we sort of finish where we started, which is the answer is you're going to have to read. Um, read the protocol. Uh, it is incredibly long. It's quite boring. It's going to take a lot of use before we all understand it inside and out um, and understand all the nuances of it. Uh, lots of lots of issues as we've tried to highlight. Uh, it's a bit of a best guess as to what's going to happen. Um, no doubt in six months time we'll get a, a bit of an idea as to which way the winds are blowing and what judges are likely to do. Um, and at that point, and no doubt if we did the same seminar again, we'd be able to give more concrete answers to many questions that we raised and, and you raised. Um, but until that time, um, <laughs> We, we send you with our, our best wishes and lots of luck um, and hope that the protocol functions semi um, smoothly to get going. Um, thank you for all attending um, and I'm sure we'll see you at, at other webinars and similar in the future. <laughs>